rumoured uh, here that actually um, barbecue really does have aspirations to, to actually take over and, and actually become what I think would probably be the first gang uh, coalition running a country. But how difficult is it to get to, to Port-au-Prince, to get into Haiti, even as a, as a media member? Because we don't, we don't hear very much directly out of the country. What's it like getting in there and, and staying there? Um, it is quite difficult to get in. Um, the uh, border to the Dominican Republic is, uh, is, is pretty much closed. Uh, to the north, you can cross pretty much by foot to get into Haiti uh, on an occasional basis. Um, um, but uh, that is to a place called Cap Haitien. But that's very, very separate and very different to uh, life uh, here in, in Port-au-Prince. Um, I don't want to go into the details of exactly where, how we got in, but uh, just to say it is quite complicated. I, just, I think that's fair to say. I can imagine that. And tell us what it's, what, what it's like there, because at the minute we've had reports out of there that it's, there's no one governing it. It's a failed state. What, what is it, what's it like to be in, in the capital? Paint a picture for us. Yeah, it is very much a failed state. There's a, there's a void in the government, and in many ways there has been for a very, very long time. Although there was a prime minister here, Ariel Henry, he was very unpopular. He couldn't really control um, much of, of Port-au-Prince or even the rest of the country for that matter. Um, the problem, I think, the gangs control so much of the city that large areas are just simply no go. You just can't go there. Um, if you did, you would either be robbed or killed if you, if you attempted to get there without permission. There's no, uh, it, it still functions. I mean, there are markets, people do get food, but that is still often in short supply because the gangs, uh, but particularly one gang who's, who's it's run by Jimmy Cherizier, who's known as Barbecue, can close the port, can close the airport, so, and, and has done in the past. So at one stage, for example, there was no fuel in the whole of Haiti for, for months at a time because they just simply closed it off. So that adds to this general sense of insecurity, which then flares up when the gangs decide uh, to wreak mayhem on certain districts, which they do on occasion. Um, and in the last few weeks, it's been very intense. People have to take cover, shops shut, um, obviously garages closed. So suddenly there's very little food available. Um, there's no fuel available. Electricity goes off, telecommunications go off. So it, 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 the general sense of insecurity, is, is, it's not just a sense, it's actually very real, but it means that normal life is very difficult to, to sustain. Um, it's already a very, very poor country, but the events of the last uh, few weeks or so have made it possibly the poorest country in the world now, but certainly one that's suffering um, one, of, one of the worst. I mean, it, it's not like Gaza per se, because obviously it's a very different uh, scenario. This is a big entire c country that's being attacked almost from within by gangs, as opposed to a small area uh, being attacked by a nation state. And so um, it, 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 it means that people are living in their own country and, and particularly in their own city in Port-au-Prince that is itself sort of under an internal siege. So it's very peculiar. But it means that life is, is actually fairly intolerable. And we had huge numbers of people have been forced out of their homes because the gangs have moved into their districts, either to take them over or simply to destroy them. And so what, over 30,000 people are displaced in Port-au-Prince alone. And Port-au-Prince is surrounded by gangs. So leaving it, entering and leaving is very, very difficult and very, very dangerous. So what do the gangs want? And you talk about gangs, plural. Um, I mean, one of the things they wanted was to get rid of the prime minister, which they have done. The prime minister is, is out. Uh, not in the country, but uh, uh, do these gangs work together? Do they do they have an, a, an aim? I mean, what are they trying to do? What's what's the plan if there is one? <laughs> if that's such a good question and, and one that uh, leaves us uh, scratching our heads on a fairly regular basis. Jimmy uh, Cherizier, uh, I'll call him barbecue, it's much easier, is effectively the head of what they call the G9, which is a group of nine gangs in this area. Now, there are many more. Um, but that grouping, and Jimmy particularly, sees himself as a sort of cross between Robin Hood and Che Guevara, he's a former policeman. He, as, as, as you said, led what they described as a sort of revolution, getting Henri or Henry out of, out of office, which they've achieved. But it hasn't stopped anything at all. It hasn't stopped their operations. So to say that he is Che Guevara would be incorrect, because actually he's a straight up uh, criminal. 
um, interestingly with his past of being a, a police officer uh, himself. The the plan that has been agreed by CARICOM, which is the sort of governing body, the organization of countries in the Caribbean, is for a transitional council of seven people to be set up. They will then set a date for, for new elections. Um, Henry will um, formally stand down when they start sitting. But uh, Barbecue and his gangs have said they're not going to accept that. We don't really know why at this stage, and they've not explained it in any shape or form. We hope to try to get to them and get some information about exactly what they want to achieve. They say it's a revolution, but if you if you think about it, if you take Che Guevara as an example, you, the, the idea would be to continue, but yeah. maybe they don't have the power to do that because despite being on the back foot initially, uh, the police here are, are fighting back to a degree as far as we can tell. Certainly there was a massive, two prisons were taken out and thousands of, of prisoners um, returned to their homes and rejoined the gangs. And I think that put the police on the back foot. But in the last few days, they have been uh, seemingly pushing back. A couple of um, senior gang members have been killed, gang leaders, I should say. Um, and so it's possible that they, they will be able to put up a more effective defence. In the initial stages, they literally were, were outgunned and outmanned. And the, the gangs very working very closely together. It just spread the police far too thinly. They just couldn't cover the cover the city. But that... And maybe, that sorry. Sorry, and maybe the gangs want... Maybe that's the end in itself, that gangs want a sort of dystopian chaos where effectively... They can. There is no government because the prime minister's out. They haven't set up the new elections. You have police, but who are the police really working for if there's no one in government? Maybe that's the chaos that they want to, to live in. Is that possible? Yeah, it's, it's very possible that actually, and we've seen it all over the world with gangs. Um, Ecuador recently, for example, it wasn't that they actually wanted to change anything politically. They just want business to continue as normal and by creating chaos. Um, in Ecuador, for example, it's particularly due with the narco trade business, which is what they wanted to continue. Here, it's, it, it'll be very similar, that they actually want to continue their business as before. Um, and um, breaking down the government, breaking down the n n normal institutions, then allows them to, to continue unabated. But there appears to be more, slightly more to it than that. But actually, what that is, I don't know. I mean, it's rumoured here. It, it is rumoured uh, here that actually um, barbecue really does have aspirations to, to actually take over and, and actually become what I think would probably be the first gang uh, coalition running a country. I'm not so convinced they're capable of that, to be honest. But that might be a, an ambition of his. All I do know is, that, and what we do know is that the people here are um, exhausted by all of this. Exhausted, you know, the, the country has has was already a mess long before the earthquake happened here. But the, the enormous earthquake, they've never really recovered from that at all. And so it's been a sort of chaotic, um, poorly led country for a very long time, desperately poor, and, and and no obvious way out of it. And this has just made things worse. And can the, I mean, one plan is for the UN forces led by Kenya. Why Kenya is an interesting question that you'll know the answer to that I don't. Um, is that possible that a UN force comes in, it, 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 it clears the ground of some of these gangs, it sets up the democratic process? Is that, is that, is that one solution to this? It is a, a, it's a potential solution, I suppose. I think Kenya wants to see itself as a major international player. Um, by all accounts, though, I've not seen this myself, but I'm told that Kenya has been used to this in, in Africa on other occasions, so I just don't know if that's true or not. Um, but they will obviously get some, um, some financial benefits from putting men on the ground here. Um, the idea, you know, the most natural countries to do this are, are, are the United States, who will help with money but won't put feet on the ground. Um, there was a group of South American countries were, were uh, prepared at one stage to get involved. They, they, that seems to have been withdrawn. Uh, Canada will assist as well. But th th I think the concept of, of having um, white soldiers um, subjugating black um, poor people is, is not something the international community is going to want to see. And certainly none of the Caribbean countries would want to see that either. So that would be why an African force comes in. However, you know, they don't speak Patois, they don't speak French. And I know the gang territories, I've been in and out of them many times. And, um, you know, if you don't know your way around there, 
uh, it, it would be an absolute bloodbath. I mean, these, 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 these gangs are well armed. I mean, it's not, they don't have any shortages of, of weapons. So sh I don't know how strongly a force um, would have to be to, to control it. I mean, are we talking about absolutely taking it into a war zone? And if that's the case, then, you know, there's displaced people absolutely everywhere. There's people still living in the communities where the gangs are in control. And in many ways, the people who live in those communities are quite happy with the gangs there because actually it's actually safer inside um, Barbecue's district, for example, than in, in other places. I can't see how it would work unless... There is something, an incentive for the gangs to allow it to happen and to, to cooperate. But I can't see what that is because it will just mean end of business and end of business is not what they'll put up with. And just finally, Stuart, I mean, this, I find this so fascinating that I could get on a plane now and go to the Dominican Republic on the same island as you and have a five star holiday in idyllic situation. And Haiti is known as this the unluckiest country in the world that it has natural disasters. It made some decisions about chopping trees down, which has impoverished it. But it feels like you're not that far away from a fairly stable country that is a tourist destination. And yet it's very hard to get where you are and you're living in almost a dystopia. It's kind of extraordinary, isn't it, when you think of it? It's absolutely extraordinary. And Dominican Republic is making absolutely no bones about it. It's going to stay that way. That's why the borders are shut. They're not interested in having a huge number of Haitians crossing the border. And it's, they're not involved in trying to calm things down here. As far as they're concerned, it's the, it's, it's the international community and Haiti's problem. And Dominican Republic is going to maintain that position because, as you say, it is a success story and it's a, it's a great place to go to. And people go there all the time. That is one of the interesting things. You know, there's, there's, there's holiday flights coming into Dominican Republic, even as we're talking now. And yet, literally next door here, the only planes you will, the only, there's no planes, the airport is shut. The only helicopters you will hear are those that are taking people away, evacuating them um, to the north where they're getting flights um, out to the United States where people are being, you know, taken away as, as effectively as refugees. So that, that's all you are. As I say, Port-au-Prince, which is really interesting about Port-au-Prince, is that it is actually completely cut off. Um, and if you're in it, short of paying a fortune to gangs th to get on buses to maybe get out of town without being robbed or kidnapped, many people just simply won't you know, chance it. And so they're stuck here. Many of them living in schools in their thousands upon thousands, unable to move, unable to work, very little food for them. Um, it's, it's miserable. Well, it's so important that you're there. You got in. We'll hope you get out at some point, Stuart, but it's really useful to, to hear, hear the testimony. And it's not clear where the story ends. So thank you so much for, for bringing to us where we've got to so far. Thank you. Pleasure.